Boldness. This is the third installment of some of our audience's boldest opinions that they claim they put their own money on in 2022 college football. We start with the defending national champs, the Georgia Bulldogs, even though it's impossible to defend a championship if they can't take it from you. But 21 champs says Georgia's going to be back in the playoff again. This didn't sound too bold to me, but it did give me an excuse to talk about something with Georgia. So this is like a three on the boldness scale, maybe even less. Uh, but Georgia's got an excellent shot. I was looking at some of the odds today, overwhelming odds to win the SEC East, and they'll probably be back in Atlanta. We know all that. It's not wildly bold, but what is different is the kind of Georgia that could make the playoff. You need to follow me here for a second because it, it'll sound convoluted. It's really not. Several different versions of Georgia would be capable of making the playoff this year. If Georgia is as good or better than they were last year, it stands to reason they'll probably make the playoff. If they're not as good as they were last year, there's still a pretty wide gap between where Georgia was and wherever the next best team in the SEC East probably is. So it stands to reason they could fall off a little bit from last year and they could still run the slate undefeated in the regular season. Even if they drop one in Atlanta may still have a good enough resume to get in, but that team would just be far more vulnerable once it got to the playoff. There are many examples of this. Georgia's trying to be the fifth team to repeat as college football playoff appearances go. Uh, Bama's done it, Oklahoma's done it, Ohio State's done it. So now Georgia's trying to do it. It's not getting there that would be the tallest task. That's why the prediction in and of itself is not bold. But think about 2014 FSU. I know there wasn't a playoff the year before. So FSU wins the title the year before. And then they went undefeated in the regular season the next year. But everyone who watched that FSU team knew it was just a product of a bakery soft schedule because once they got in the playoff, they got exposed immediately. Even though they brought a lot of the same players back, Jameis Winston was still the quarterback, even FSU fans knew this team would get run out of the building by last year's team. We're a sitting duck. And they were. Actually, I think, ironically enough, they lost to Oregon. So you fast forward a few years, Bama wins the title in 15. They go back to the championship game in 2016. Even though they lost to Clemson, I actually thought that 2016 team may have been better than the 2015 team. They were sharp. They were ultra hungry all year. So which version of Georgia do we get this year? Do we get like the 2014 FSU version or do we get a 2016 Alabama version? That is the most interesting facet to me. It's not bold to say they'll make the playoff. Do they make the playoff looking every bit as hungry and every bit as good as they did last year? That would be a little bolder because of the consequences of success as we talk about on the show a lot. Next up, we're going to ratchet up the boldness scale quite a bit here. Bubba said, well, did he ask? Yeah, Bubba said, NC State only loses one game, finishes the regular season top six, and gets close to making the college football playoff. Obviously, you look up what you think about NC State. Kind of, like I said the other day, kind of an anonymous program, not for you, those of you in Raleigh, but kind of an anonymous program nationally. So you know about Devin Leary. You know they play good defense and you would be right on both accounts. They were a top 20 defensive unit last year. Return mostly intact. Uh, they don't have to worry about any complacency there because they didn't really accomplish anything last year in terms of winning you know, something that you can put in a trophy case. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt Dave Doran will have them ready, but this is not just about, okay, well, can they beat Clemson? Or it's not even about, you know, is the team solid? Because we didn't say our prediction is for them to finish top 20. That'd be good. We're talking about them bordering on playoff contention here. To do that, you have to handle the altitude that no one on that team has dealt with yet. Doesn't mean they're incapable of it. It's first time for everything, but I'll get back to that in a second. But I don't see any buzzsaw team in their conference. I don't see a buzzsaw team, therefore, on their schedule. And what that means is if you've got the kind of defense that I highly expect they'll have, and, you know, who are you going up against? You're going up against... Uh, Florida State, Clemson, Virginia Tech, you know their ACC schedule. There's no offense you look at and you go, ooh, I don't even think our defense is going to match up there. Quite the opposite. Most teams on their schedule are looking and saying, we got to go up against that NC State defense. That in and of itself is something to be proud of. But then, let's just say for argument's sake, they start off 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's say they start off 4-0. Don't overlook that Texas Tech game, by the way. They start off 4-0 and then they go to Clemson to start October and they win like they did last year. They beat Clemson on the road. Okay, then you'd be 5-0. You still got over half of your season left to go. You'd have Florida State. 
you'd go to Syracuse, you'd have Virginia, you'd have Wake, really tough back-to-back -back there. You'd have Boston College after that, at Louisville, at North Carolina. The thing about trying to make the playoff is even that November 19th game at Louisville, you look at that and you say, well, if we're good enough to beat Clemson, we should be handling Louisville. Should is the optimum word there. Because a lot of potential playoff contenders, when they get into November, end up not doing things they should do. What is it? Well, it's the altitude. It's the difference in walking the tightrope 10 feet above the ground versus 10 stories above the ground. It's still you. Balance still works the same. The tightrope is the exact same width, but all of a sudden, because you know what the consequences are if you fall, human nature is a funny thing. The human mind is a funny thing. So this is bold to a point of seven on the one to 10 scale to suggest they finish top six, not because I think they're incapable, just because I know how hard it is to be a contender all the way through as opposed to just being one through Halloween. A lot of folks still in the mix at Halloween time that aren't in the mix uh, come Pearl Harbor Day, which I know because it's my birthday. I don't want to have said that, but we're live. We move on. It gets personal here with the next one. Asphalt Cowboy. His bold prediction is that my beloved Arkansas is not going to be as serious as I think they are. Now, what he did not do is follow it up with how serious do I think Arkansas is? A lot of you have a misconception about me and Arkansas. The misconception is not that I love them. I absolutely love them. The misconception is I, I think some of you honestly believe I've predicted them to win the national championship this year. I have not gone that far yet. But what I have done is I have painted a, a pretty clear picture of my impression of the program. So to be clear, if we don't know what my expectation for Arkansas is this year, I'm not going to give you a predicted record in April, mainly because it would be dumb. But what I will tell you is I expect this team to be at least as good as last year's squad. Defensively, I think they'll be better than last year's squad. Unlike a certain colleague of mine, I believe K.J. Jefferson is and will be a top three quarterback in the SEC this year. Uh, but if not, still a very, very solid player there. Jaden Hazelwood, plugging him in, plugging guys like Drew Sanders in, it's going to make an impact. I also highly expect that they have one of the toughest schedules in the country. And because of that, this could be a top 10 caliber team and still lose multiple games. It's all relative. You are not what your schedule says you are in college football 100% of the time. So I expect them to be in that nine win range, but with an opportunity to compete in every game. So it wouldn't shock me if they won double digit games. It wouldn't shock me if they won eight games. This is the kind of schedule where you could win eight games and I could still have you power rated like number 14 or 15 in the country. Those are my expectations for Arkansas. Now, if you tell me they're going to fall short of that, I'm telling you that's a nine on the boldness scale. They're not falling short of that. Unless they suffer catastrophic amounts of injuries, they're not going to fall short of that. They could lose to Cincy in week one and still I don't think they'd fall short of it. I don't predict them to, but I'm just telling you, I think it's about more than 2022 with them. But if you're talking about 2022, this is going to be a really good team. I keep saying the same thing about Arkansas that I'll reiterate and I say it about Ole Miss and I just think they're a prisoner of their conference when it comes to expectations. Now, when you play the game, expectations don't matter. Predictions don't matter. We all know that. But this team has a chance to take the world by surprise, not because they're going to show potential that you didn't know about. They may just upset a few people you didn't think they were capable of upsetting. The potential's there. If that team was in the ACC. You would see them on magazine covers all over newsstands, all over every grocery store in town in the South but they're in the SEC West. And so the first thing you think is, they can't beat Bama. What if they don't? You could be the number two team in the country and not beat Alabama. So what does that really mean? So Arkansas, yeah, you think they're going to fall short of my expectations. That's a nine on the boldness scale. Next up, we head to the Big Ten. Interesting submission here. Jacob Scott Ringwald said, Michigan's going to win the Big Ten. I don't think they're necessarily better than Ohio State, but I think their schedule is more favorable. Well, Here's the problem with that. If you think their schedule is more favorable to the tune of separation by two games, then I'll listen to you. But unless Michigan goes into the horseshoe undefeated and Ohio State's already got two conference losses, that doesn't really matter because the tiebreaker would come into effect. So I'm looking at their schedule right now. If you're watching on YouTube, yeah, it is a favorable schedule. They don't leave home until October. 
Uh, they go back to back Iowa and Indiana on the road. Then they got Penn State and Michigan State back to back, but with a bye week in there. Uh, they close it out with a three game stretch before the end of season rivalry game against Ohio State, about as fortuitous as you can. They go to Rutgers, they got Nebraska, and they got Illinois. So here's the big question with Michigan. Several of them, actually. Uh, number one, what we can't know is where is the program collectively, mentally, after the whole Jim Harbaugh thing? Can't know that. I'm not, I'm not suggesting anything. I'm saying we flat out cannot know whether he fully checked back in. Remember, they lost both coordinators. McDonald went back to the Ravens. Uh, Gaddis went to Miami. They lost both coordinators now. And you've got a head coach that actively tried to get out and only is back because they wouldn't have him. That may not mean anything. You may be watching in week three and say, remember when folks thought that was going to be a big deal? Maybe that's the way it'll go. I'm quite literally telling you we don't know. There's another one on the quite literally chart. But after that, there's some things we do know. And we know, for instance, the coordinators are gone, but we also know they got both quarterbacks back. Uh, we know that last year, or at least we think we know, changed something about the psyche of this team. They did a lot of stuff last year that you were told and they were told for a long time they had just grown incapable of doing. And that was never the case. But yet I guarantee you some of the folks in that organization needed to see it be done, to think it could be done. So 2022, what part of 2021 will be reflected? Will it be a lot of knocking down of Berlin walls and now everything is possible and they play like it because they saw that it could all be done and they just play with a sum greater than the individual part sort of mentality. If they're that, they can win the Big Ten again this year. They, they certainly can. But there's also the other possibility that in good conscience, you have to acknowledge. It could also be that they didn't get all the way back. They had some key losses. Let's talk about it now. Let's not just ignore the elephant in the room. They've got some key losses. They got some key big time role players defensively to replace uh, coordinators to replace. But also if Harbaugh didn't get himself and his program fully checked back in, then if that part of 2021 is reflected in 2022, they'll lose several games. And that game will be an off afterthought for the rest of college football by the time they get to Columbus. Did they get to Ohio State with one loss? Max. If they can do that, then by that time, by nature of their record, they've shown you they're fully dialed in, and you will no longer go into that Ohio State-Michigan game thinking there's no chance, there's no shot. It, the Ohio State will be favored. Uh, all the trappings will still be there to indicate Ohio State should win. The mentality that exists in that locker room is all I care about. So with that in mind, I gave this a seven. It's tough but not impossible for me to see Michigan repeating as Big Ten champ. But I'd be just as impressed if they go 10-2 and two this year and one of those losses is to Ohio State and the Buckeyes uh, beat them 42-27 to 27 en route to winning the Big Ten and headed to the playoff. If Michigan still finishes 10-2 and two, a year after all that stuff, after the season concluded last year, that'd still be a really, really good follow-up effort there on the heels of the Big Ten championship because they can't take that conference title away from you. We've got one that is, it brings me no joy. But John Yates says Brian Harson is going to be fired before early signing day this year. Early signing day is after the end of the regular season. It's before the bowls start. So it's mid-December. This is not that bold, unfortunately. I gave it a four. That's about how bold I think that is. I think that I just don't feel good about it. I don't feel good about where Auburn is right now. Uh, there are many parts of the program, let alone the team this year, that are really loose feeling. Uh, Brian Harson, I'm, I've been on record several times telling you how I feel about him. I, I thought he was done extremely wrong by some people around that and inside that program. Not most, just a few. And anyone around Auburn knows who I'm talking about. But that aside, there's still stuff you have to do. You got to recruit, you got to develop, and you got to win enough games. And if they don't do that, it doesn't matter whether I like him. It doesn't matter whether he preaches the right things. If he's not delivering results and he does not have benefit of the doubt on his side because the same folks that got tossed out the window are just in the parking lot doing push-ups right now, they'll run right back up the stairs if he doesn't win eight-plus games, in my estimation, and they'll want him out of there. And they'll think they have justification. And then... You have to peel open that preview magazine and you have to look at who Auburn plays. 
It's the reason I say this is the toughest job in major college football, because of the expectation blended with the annual challenge of the schedule they play. This is the only team that has to play Georgia every year. It's in the West. They also just decided to add Penn State for good measure on their out-of-conference schedule this year. They play Penn State, LSU, at Georgia, at Ole Miss, Arkansas, at Mississippi State, Texas A&M, at Alabama. That is a tough five-year stretch, and they're going to do it in the span of three and a half months. Where in the world are the wins? You've got Mercer, you've got San Jose State, and there's Western Kentucky towards the end of the year. Uh, They don't play Vandy this year. Uh, Games like Missouri are not a gimme W for them, even if it's home. There's just not. Not this year. They don't know who the quarterback is going to be there. They are picking from a very average quarterback room. They do not have the skill out wide. They can't break games open. Everything's got to go right. They got to play at an A minus or better level every week in conference play. And so, listen, if he gets that thing above seven wins this year, I don't want anyone to even sneeze at him because he has earned another year. Uh, You know, I always want him to have three years minimum, but that's not who makes the decision. I, I don't make the call there. The folks who make the call make the call, obvious statement. But you say Brian Harson's out of there, I, I say that's about a four on the boldness scale. What's the number? How many games does he have to win? That's kind of what I'd love to know. I'd love for someone who, who actually does pull the lever down there to tell me, how many games does he need? It's never that easy, though.